There is a story from World War II, and the story goes like this. Civilian amateur radio operators along the U.S. East Coast during World War II, just enjoying their hobby and listening, picked up from time to time German language voices in the shortwave portion of the radio spectrum. The ham radio operators notified the FCC, which, after listening to some of these transmissions, determined that they were German military radio transmissions, specifically German tank-to-tank -tank chatter from North Africa. As a result of this, the FCC would set up a network of listening stations along the East Coast with the goal of monitoring radio transmissions from the war in Europe. So is it really possible that a ham radio operator sitting in a room in a house somewhere along the East Coast could tune in and listen to German armored forces fighting in North Africa? In today's briefing, we're going to try to answer that question. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Submarine History. Today, we're going to stretch our luck and continue our briefings on radio, and I'm going to call this one Radio 202 for Naval Historians, where we talk about the other half of the radio equation, antennas. In this briefing, we'll be talking about the classic dipole antenna with some examples from World War II, mostly naval, and again, we'll have a tie into World of Warships. Read the description for this briefing. I've moved my promotional spot for the United States Naval Institute and the discussion on references there to shorten up the videos going forward. Okay, so it's like this. Whether you're a civilian amateur radio operator or a U.S. Navy radio man in World War II, your radio is only as good as your antenna. As I'm coming up on my six months as a licensed amateur radio operator, this is something I've had to learn uh, the hard way in my own efforts to explore the world of radio from the property that I live on. There is an antenna that we call a dipole, which is like the classical antenna from the early days of radio. The dipole is a straight conductor that is one half the wavelength of the frequency we want to transmit on. Dipole antennas can be oriented horizontally or vertically. This is called polarization. Some things about dipole antennas. A dipole is resonant or efficient when its length is one half the wavelength of the frequency we want to transmit on. Resonant antennas offer more power, higher efficiency, and better performance over non-resonant antennas. Schematically, uh, this is how a horizontal dipole antenna looks. Horizontal dipole antennas were important back in World War II because militaries communicated largely in the medium frequency and high frequency range of the radio spectrum. In these areas of the spectrum, the wavelengths get pretty big and you need a long antenna to be, in, to be efficient. And there is a simple calculation we can do to tell us how long of a dipole antenna we need for the frequency we want to treat, uh, excuse me, to transmit on. And in, in this example, uh, we want to transmit on 3.550 megahertz. And we want to know how long our antenna should be. So we're going to divide 468 uh, divided by 3.55, and that's going to give us 132 feet. And if we're making the classic dipole, each half of the antenna would be 66 feet. Now, there are times when we are not able to match the length of an antenna to what we need in the field or at sea. In the case where a transmitter has to work many frequencies with a single antenna of a fixed size, an antenna tuner is used to match the transmitter to the antenna for a given frequency. This is how the uh, radiation pattern of a horizontal dipole looks. You can see from the picture that our antenna is horizontal and that the radio signal expands out like a donut that would run the length of our horizontal dipole. And if I had like 100,000 subscribers, I would pay someone to make some really cool animations to demonstrate this principle, but I don't, so this is what you get. When we are less than one quarter of a wavelength above ground, a horizontal dipole has near vertical incident sky wave characteristics, ENVIS. As you approach one half the wavelength above ground, the takeoff angle will decrease, making it good for distance communication, and it will become more directional. If I take our horizontal dipole antenna 
turn it 90 degrees and get rid of the lower half of the antenna, I'm left with a vertical dipole antenna, which we can also call a rod antenna. This is the same propagation picture uh, we used for the horizontal dipole. It's just turned on its side, uh, like we did with the antenna itself. You have to picture this donut that expands outwards, gradually increasing its angle of radiation. Great ground wave propagation with this antenna and the low radiation takeoff angle is good for long distance communications. However, you will definitely deal with a high frequency skip zone that can be sizable. These antennas take up less space than a horizontally polarized antenna, and they're easier to move around the battlefield. And if you think about it, not at all practical to be moving around the battlefield trying to hang horizontal wires to talk to a company a mile down the road. But a vertical antenna can easily do that, especially since as the war progresses, we see more VHF and UHF communication equipment being deployed, and they are inherent to small vertical antennas typically less than 25 feet tall, oftentimes between 2 and 10 feet. I picked HMS Hood uh, from uh, World of Warships. You'll note an array of horizontal wires supported by the mast, something like 150 feet long, uh, and pretty high up, about 80 to 100 feet. So that horizontal antenna is going to have great distance characteristics. And if you look closely, you can... Between the stacks, see a set of wires that have a cone shape. It looks like an N-fed sloper antenna array with four elements spaced 90 degrees apart to give it omnidirectional coverage. Uh, this antenna, because of its angular shape, has characteristics of a horizontal and vertical antenna, which would make it useful for shorter range communication and could bridge that first skip zone gap normally associated with high frequency communications. We've seen the U995 before and its two horizontal uh, an antenna elements, fore and aft. Uh, they're clearly uh, visible in this picture. Uh, U-boats did have a vertical rod antenna that could be extended while the boat was at periscope depth. Uh, but those antennas were prone to bending, and that problem probably was not solved until the introduction of snorkels and their low-drag hydrodynamic, excuse me, their low-drag hydrodynamic shrouds. And here we have a picture of a, uh, a Gato class, and you should be able to see the horizontal antenna after the conning tower with its vertical support towards the stern. This picture uh, is from the USS Cod, also a Gato class submarine uh, and museum ship here in my hometown of Cleveland. Great museum ship, for the most part still in its World War II configuration, and the volunteer crew keeps it in meticulous shape. Uh, it's considered the best preserved example of a World War II era Gato, uh, meaning it had not gone uh, undergone uh, the guppy upgrades after the war. But here we see the horizontal antenna in a different location than in the previous picture. Uh, but that was not uncommon. Oftentimes when a boat came into port for overhaul and refit, communications gear and antennas would be upgraded and moved around to make things more efficient. Uh, the volunteer crew of the USS Cod still uses this antenna today for amateur radio communications, and they're able to reach Australia with it. Here uh, is the typical vertical antenna we've probably all seen at some point in the movies and seen pictures of. Uh, the man-portable VHF radio, in this case the SCR-300, which was a U.S.-made low-power VHF radio for battlefield communications during World War II. And here we have the USS Cod again. Uh, this time we're looking at its vertical antenna. Really hard to see, I know, and uh, that's why I have it circled. This is a pretty tall antenna, and it solved the problem uh, the Germans had with their vertical rod antennas and bending. Uh, this is an antenna that is solid. It's not made up of connected pieces that are extended and retracted. This antenna is connected to the counting tower by a spring-loaded hinge at its base. There is a plate attached to the antenna which resists water pressure as the boat dives and bends the entire antenna over to a horizontal position where it's locked in place while the boat is submerged. And I'm guessing uh, that if the boat was going slow enough underwater, the lock could be released to allow that antenna to move to its vertical, pos excuse me, vertical position for use while at periscope depth. Uh, and then when they were done transmitting, they could then pick up speed a little bit and push the antenna back down to its horizontal position. 
And then we really can't complete our discussion on horizontal and vertical antennas without talking about aircraft for a moment. Uh, in these pictures, you'll see a number of vertical nubs sticking up from the plane fuselage. Some of these are VHF antennas. Some serve purposes like uh, IFF beacons. And others are just masks that support horizontal wire antennas, which could be used for VHF and HF communications. Depending on the plane, uh, HF and VHF radios could be present together. The difference between a single seat plane and planes with crews is that HF radios in a single seat plane would have only been used for voice, where on multi-seat planes like the SBD, your rear gunner was also a radio operator keying Morse code on HF. All right, so now we're back where we started and the question is, could ham radio operators on the U.S. East Coast pick up German tank-to-tank -tank chatter over 4,000 miles away on the battlefields of North Africa during World War II? Well, uh, the answer is yeah. It's definitely possible. And in fact, it did happen. German tanks uh, used low-power radios, less than 30 watts, that operated in the medium frequency and upper high-frequency spectrums. These tanks had vertical antennas that could be between 2 and 10 meters in height. Now, today, there's a very similar arrangement that amateur radio operators use for something called DXing, uh, which is long-distance, high-frequency communications using low-power radios, 20 watts or less, with vertical antennas 17 to 25 feet in height. Amateurs use this setup all the time to do long-distance radio. Now, in the description to this video, I have a link to a video from Walt K4OGO's Coastal Waves and Wires YouTube channel, where he demonstrates these long-distance communication principles by making contacts uh, up to 4,000 miles away, actually over 4,000 miles away, using antennas, uh, vertical antennas, about 17 to 20 feet tall and a 20-watt high-frequency radio. Now, the way I told the story when we started the briefing was actually told to me from another uh, amateur radio operator. In reality, the FCC back in 1940 had taken the initiative to set up radio listening posts around the country for the purpose of identifying radio transmissions from spies in the U.S. As they set up these listening posts around the country, uh, and the eastern seaboard in particular, they began picking up these military transmissions from overseas and eventually, the FCC would partner with the Department of Defense for these FCC listening posts to function like the Y stations the British used to intercept German radio communications. The FCC listening post at Chopmist Hill, Rhode Island, is one of the well-known listening posts from that era, and may, we may even talk about it more down the road in another briefing. Well, that's it for today. Uh, I hope you learned something uh, and enjoyed it as, as well. If you have any questions or comments, post them below and I'll try to get back to you. Until then, peace out.